remember when Jesus cleaned the temple. <laughs> and so it says, Jesus cleanses the temple is the title. So let's go to John chapter 2. We're, gonna, we're going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And we want to be able to uh, gather some uh, beautiful uh, truths into our heart. And so John chapter 2, verse 13 says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the, the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? And he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, and when they saw the signs which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. Lord, we're praying for revelation. We're praying for the inspiration. We're praying for signs and wonders, Lord God, which is you working in our hearts, Lord, making us whole and, and freeing us, Lord, from, Lord God, this world and giving us, Lord, eternal life and power in the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So see, when Jesus is cleansing the temple, he's doing it literally, but it's a very spiritual message for all times. And that Jesus wants to cleanse, you know, we can kind of chuckle a little bit that, you know, we have a temple here and a temple here. So what's in our head, right? And what's in our heart? So this is the, this is the longest distance to mankind. It's about 12 inches right here from the head to the heart, okay? So what's between the temple there is that God wants his word. He wants us to dwell in him and wash us clean. And, and he wants us to be liberated so that we can enjoy an abundant life and also have strength and righteousness and truth within us so that we can see things with God's lens, with his cleansing. And so he does want to kind of lighten our load. Now, there's a, a, a fun story about my, my dad who loves the Lord and he's looking for the coming of the Lord and he's living in Idaho now with my sister and her husband. And, uh, and many of you have known him or know him, but um, he is 92, he's gonna be 93, and he just had a pacemaker put in. Um, and, uh, but he's, he's really alert, but he's on a walker and he's getting a little unstable on his feet. So with the pacemaker now, he's got more energy, but this is what we've worked out with the family, is that our dad has to lighten the load, okay? So he's always been such a faithful provider to carry that big old wallet, right? And all those keys. And he loves to, he loves to put change in his pocket. You know, he's that old school. He loves that change in his pocket. And, but his pants get weighed down, okay? So he's been cinching up his belt and everything. And that's how he had a recent accident. So this is what we did. And we said, Dad, you know what? You have been such a good steward. You don't need your wallet anymore because my sister pays his bills and everything. And you, you know, you don't need, and you know, he doesn't carry a cell phone. So he's just going to get some nice 
uh, you know, fitting pants. You can get them at Costco. They just, you don't need a belt. Wear your shirt out. And dad, travel light. Travel light. You've earned it, sir, right? So now he can get around with his walker. He doesn't have to worry about cinching up his belt anymore or, you know, carrying that big heavy wallet, you know. So we can kind of chuckle. He earned it. He's 92. And, uh, but guess what? You and I need to lighten some of the load, too. And we need to lighten some of the burdens, the, an the anger, the animosity, you know, the, 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 just the anxiety of, of what's happening in our, in our government and different things. There's just so many things, family issues that can weigh us down. And so that we are just, we're, we're stumbling and we're falling. And Jesus wants us to be lifted up. Jesus wants us to be edified. He wants us to put a big old dumpster outside of, the, of your soul or your house and just throw away everything that you don't need. Amen? Old furniture, old things, and, and you know, clean the house. You know, and we're just talking about in the natural. But, uh, you know, we did have to pull out that, um, the lantanas in front of our church because they were dead. They were dead of no use. So we had to pull them out and filled the whole van full and took it to the dump. And, and now there's some morning lights there. And there's some myrtle there in the front of the tree. But see, we have to take out some of the old dead things so that new things can come in. New things can grow. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants us to constantly be growing and experiencing Him. And guess what? When you get rid of the clutter in the house, you got less to trip on, right? You got more living space, right? But I mean, it is, it is natural, but it's also spiritual that Jesus is cleaning house here. He's getting the junk out. There's a lot of junk that we inherit from society and from, you know, saying things that have come down, generational strongholds and some of our own misdoings. And so God has to, he just wants us clean and happy. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, happy and clean. <laughs> happy and clean. That's God's goal. And that's what he's doing here. So Jesus is coming into the temple. Now, um, this is a story about a young man, and he was in a, 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 just a CVS store, and he was on his cell phone. And so he was talking, and the cashier he heard him speaking, and he said, he said, hello? The, yes, sir. He says, I'm calling to see if you need a gardener, uh, somebody that can mow your lawn and, and clean up your yard. Do you need anybody? And the gentleman said, no, I have somebody. And he said, is he doing a good job? And, uh, and, the, and the man said, yes, he is. He says, well, thank you so much, sir. Goodbye. Well, the cashier at the CVS store was saying, oh, son, I'm sorry you didn't get the job. He said, no, sir, I have the job. I was just calling to see if I was just checking up on myself. <laughs> so, you know, we need to kind of check up on ourselves, too. How, how are we doing? Amen. And uh, God just, you know, he, there's always grace there. He always wants us to do, amen. He's always pleased when we, when we come to him in faith. So there's always hope in Christ. So let's learn some things about uh, the temple here. Um, this is, um, Jesus is in the, uh, a temple that had taken 546 years to complete to get to this point where Jesus comes in. I mean, the temple is pristine at this time. But going back in history, that at 586 B.C., uh, they were warned, but they lost their land, and they lost their temple, and it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and they went in 70 years in captivity. And then after many prayers and God's mercy, they were able to come back to the land, and they were able to rebuild the temple under Ezra. But when you looked at Ezra's temple... And then Nehemiah came later. It was just like a box. It was, you know, it was very crudely put together. And, and it was a blessing. It was a beginning. But then each generation, each century, you know, they would do a little bit more on the temple. And then Herod got involved, King Herod. And he just took it to a whole new level. So basically, his family, and they were, they were responsible for about 84 years of, of just beautifying the temple. They enlarged it to be like 500 yards by 400 yards. That's like 48 college basketball courts. It was huge. The, uh, the walls were 60 feet. 
the temple went up like four steps, and the temple itself was 90 feet high, and everything that you could see on high was covered in gold so that when people were coming into the city, uh, they could just see the gold and the shimmer. It was pristine. The temple had come to, you know, a full, like, uh, restoration, a beautification, uh, marble gates. Um, one one uh, stone that was in the temple was made with huge white marble blocks. It was 27 feet long, 27 feet long, a stone of marble, you know, in this gorgeous temple. And so everything was marble, it was beautiful. But Jesus was going to make an observation. And if you, you know, if you want to turn to Mark 13, 1 and 2, um, Jesus was there with his disciples on one occasion. And his disciples said, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? And Jesus replied, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. So that's Mark 13, 1 and 2. So Jesus, they were admiring the temple. It was beautiful. But, and, it, and it continued. After his death and resurrection, they continued to beautify it. In fact, they finished the, everything, the final touches, about 64 after the death of Christ. But lo and behold, six years later, Titus is going to come in, a Roman emperor, and completely destroy the temple because, once again, they had disobeyed as a people, and they, they would lose their temple again. And so what Jesus is saying is don't put your trust in stones. Don't put your trust in gold. Don't put your trust in the stock market. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. Bank on Christ. Be a good steward. And, uh, and just know that the, that the housing market is unstable. The worldly system is unstable. But Jesus is the rock. Amen. And you can bank on Christ and build on Christ. And so it's so amazing, the peace that we can have when we come to him. That's what Jesus is trying to get these disciples ready. And that was the big problem and the issue that they had with Jesus' teaching is that he was saying that the temple would be destroyed. They were worshiping the temple. They were worshiping their houses. They were worshiping their security. And so we can find ourselves as well as, as uh, you know, Americans or people, right, or all around the world just, just wanting to be secure in this world, well, it's temporary. And turn to your neighbor and tell them, bank on Christ. <laughs> Amen. He will never fail. And he's, and he's coming back again. He's coming back again. And it was so neat uh, at the fair there in... Um, over in Santee, and uh, Keegan and Griffin were, uh, you know, bearing the flag there. It was so beautiful, and, and the Miss Santees over there it was a really special fair, and they did such a good job in representing the flag in our country. And, um, and I got to talk with the mayor there, and it was so neat that um, we were praying with the mayor. He's a friend of mine and from Santee, and, uh, and John Minto, we were praying before he was the mayor. We would sit together at these events, and he says, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a retired policeman, and I'm, I would really, you know, I think I could do a good job. It, it was such a privilege, but we prayed, and, and, uh, and it was so neat. He ends up being, you know, the God-fearing uh, mayor, you know, over there at Santee. Um, but he was talking about, well, what's the last book in the Bible? I said, Revelations. And we talked about what, what is the last words of Jesus? He says, I'm coming soon. <laughs> I'm coming soon, he says, and that was 2,000 years ago. Let the grace of God be with you. Okay, so uh, it was neat. So in the light of all the perplexities of being a mayor or your perplexities and challenges, Jesus is coming soon, right? And so he can help us to, to, you know, to do well and to fulfill his, his plan. All right, so it's a fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus comes into the temple, all right, it says in Mark eleven seventeen, Jesus called it a den of thieves, and he had become a place of greed and corruption. 
All right, the thing that troubled the Lord the most was this, is that I love this picture that, um, you know, Sarah picked out because it really shows Jesus, you know, he's, he's focused and, you know, some of the pictures are kind of funny. He, they, the older pictures, it's like anemic Jesus, like he, he looks like he just woke up and, and he's, you know, turning over a table. He doesn't look real strong. And, and then others, he's got a whip and he's looking real violent, like, get out of my way, you know. And he's, but this is, he's in full self-control, but what he's doing is he's making a very clear, self-controlled statement because what they had done is they had come in and, you know, people would travel to the temple, and this is Passover. A lot of times if you had big sins and you, you couldn't carry a cow with you 100 miles, that would be tough. But you could buy a cow at the temple or a goat or a turtle doves, but what they did is they went out from where they sold and they took over the court of the Gentiles. They took over the court of the women. They were just making money, you know, hand and fist. And, and remember that the court of the Gentiles was a place that God fears could come. They were not Jews, but they were respecting the Jewish faith and they were looking into it and, and they would come to that place to seek God, but they couldn't go into the inner part that the Jews could. It was very segregated. In fact, if a Gentile went through a, a certain gate, they would be put to death. And so they were using the court of the Gentiles. And then the court of the women, you know, the women could come and worship God, but they didn't have a place. What Jesus was doing, he was saying, cleanse this temple these people need to be able to seek God. You're making it a house of merchandise. How can they come in and inquire about God when all you're doing is buying and selling? Get out of the court of the Gentiles. Get out of the court of the women. Is that there's a place to do sacrifice, right? But, but they were abu abusing it. And that's why religion abuses, you know, and it, and it causes like pollution in the temple. And uh, God's, you know, cleansing the temple. I believe some of the trials we're going through in America is God is cleansing America, right? I mean, how many of us uh, appreciated when gas prices were, <laughs> you know, $3, right? And so we can say, wow, you know, I'd like to get back to that. But we can also learn from certain things that are going on, pressures that are going on. But God is cleansing the pollution and the defilement. And he's also fulfilling prophecy when he comes into the temple. Because remember, the temple would be destroyed. But God, for all times, wants to cleanse our hearts he wants to strengthen us. He wants to, us to be learners and discerners, and he wants us ready for heaven, right? He wants us ready, amen, to have an abundant life down here, but we just don't want to get entangled. Here's a prophecy from Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, Suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, says the Lord Almighty, this is 400 years before Jesus appeared at the temple. And he says, Lord Almighty, but who can endure the day of his coming? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launder's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. That's Malachi 3, 1 through 3. So he's out to take out some of the pollution. Now, some of you, you know, remember the 90s and the Assemblies of God went through a real cleansing at that time. And, uh, you know, we had some public evangelists that got into some trouble. And, you know, Jimmy swaggered and, and, uh, and then it was Jim Baker and they got into trouble and they got disciplined. And, and Jimmy swaggered is back, you know, serving the Lord, doing well. And, uh, but they had to be stepped down because they had gotten into some corruptions. And uh, that was a good thing. But what's beautiful is, is that, the, that it says in 1 Peter 4.17, judgment must begin at the house of God. And so in order for us to be healed, we have to 
be cleansed. That's why confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And the beautiful thing is, is as a movement, you know, we're 70 million strong. We really learned from that. And there was a lot more correction that came. But guess what? If a minister falls into sin, they are taken out of the ministry and they have to be restored. And sometimes that process is five years. It could be 10 years. But if they hang in there, they can get back into the pulpit. But there has to be accountability. And it's not all that it's not the same way in a lot of parts of the body of Christ. So we can thank the Lord that there is, you know, a high standard. And I think and believe it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of where we want to be. The Holy Spirit is the emphasis. Pentecost is coming next week. Historic Pentecost that there's power for us to be able to change some things, dynamite some things, you know, uh, you know that, that have been in our way that are blocking us, that the, it's not by power, it's not by might, it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not because, you know, our troubles of our family or our country or, or our neighbor is that we can break through. We can get the breakthrough. We can get, amen, that new life and that new water and, and that cleansing because of Jesus. He says so there's hope for all. Turn to your neighbor and tell him there's hope for all. Amen. You are full of hope. And so Jesus wants to come in the power of the Holy Spirit. So our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Jesus wants to be Lord of all. Okay. And um, now listen, he'll take what he can get. All right, but it's not going to work completely unless Jesus is Lord of all. So that's that's a great confession to say, Jesus, you are Lord of all. You are Lord of my life, Amen. And then don't go back and take back this and that. But I'm going to do this and this and this and that. But Lord, you're Lord of all. And the thing is, is God's going to take what He can get. All right, but we're not going to be able to have the victory that He wants until we say, Jesus. You have the best plan. Your will be done. Your will be done. And that helps us so much when we're wrestling with ourselves. What should I do? You know what? Cry out, God, your will be done. And it settles our heart. And then the Holy Spirit shows us what that will is. And, uh, and it may be pleasing. It might be harder. But um, that's the one that will, will win every time. So it says in... 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Amen. And so your body's not your own. It's, it's God's. He, he made you. He created you, and what's neat is stewardship is that's the greatest thing to know that however we came into this world, God loves us, and there's a divine imprint. There's a stamp of God in our life, and so there's a divine pattern if we get into it, and, uh, and so that's, that's where we, guess who is the best counselor of all times? His name is the Holy Spirit, and you know, a lot of times through COVID and people and trouble and stresses and inflation and all this stuff, and people are, you know, running more to counselors. I need a counselor. And then guess what? Then there's more credit card debt because the counselor charges you a lot. And, you know, and, and some of the times what they say is not really all that helpful. But I'm saying if, if people are, are getting counsel, then that's fine if it's helping in the long run. But guess who is the best counselor of all time? times and he's free his name is jesus and the holy spirit is right there in the word and so he counsels us he comforts us he convicts us and it's so beautiful and he shows us you know how how to do this thing how to do life but there's a law of sowing and reaping and so if we plant you know worldly things in our hearts guess what we're going to reap right but if we plant the word of God, I mean, 
Galatians is really powerful. We're not going to get in there, but it talks about that if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then it goes into the whole list of the, of the works of the flesh, and they get dark, and they get dirty, and they get and everything else. So in other words, if we stay filled with the Holy Spirit, we will be retained. We will be safe. We will, we will be able to resist, right, the darkness. And we'll be able to, to live out the plan of God for our life. And it's, and it's so beautiful. But if we're not doing what we should, if we're not feeding ourselves with the word of God and we're, we're kind of straying, then what happens is, is our temple gets empty. And you don't want an empty temple, Turn your neighbor and tell him, no empty temple. Okay, because if, so, and let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. It's a little, little scary, but it's the truth. All right, so Matthew 12, 43, it says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be also will be with this wicked generation." And so, in other words, we don't want an empty house. We want Jesus in the house, right? We want the Word of God reigning. We want the music blasting, right? We want Jesus. And, and that's why when we pray to the Lord in the morning, and He just fills our hearts, and He keeps us from emptiness, all right? Because emptiness comes through our natural humanity but God dwells within your heart richly, richly dwells within you. You're born again, and I know each one of you. But what can make us empty is just busyness, busyness, busyness. Like, Martha, Martha, why are you troubled about many things? Mary has chosen the good things to worship God and to think about God. But Martha, Martha, don't be a Martha, Martha. Right? So busy all the time, but not replenishing. Replenishing through prayer and the word and worship. And just keep yourself filled with the Lord. And you're going to have more than enough power. Amen? And that's where the good stuff is anyways. So we want to counteract, I believe, because we are in the countdown. We don't know the day and the hour. But there are so many things lining up that are undeniable that we very well could be at the end of the age. So don't you think that Satan is extra busy? Isn't he pulling out all of his bag of tricks to find empty people that have stopped going to church? You know, that, that won't pick up their Bible that, that won't say prayers, that, that harden their heart. There's more stress. There's more of a spirit that wants to take over. And don't be afraid. Fear not, right? There's 365 fear nots in the Bible. Fear not and then always keep filled, right? Filled with the word. Filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit. And, and he's, he's preserving us. Amen. From unbelief, from roast beef and unbelief. He's preserving us, all right? So a young man uh, was buying a shirt in a department store, and the shirt label said, shrink resistant. And he asked the clerk what it meant, and the clerk said this. He said, the label means that the shirt will shrink, but it doesn't want to. <laughs> so in other words, you get a cotton shirt, right? And with all good intentions, after a time, it shrinks a little bit each time. And then finally, that shirt, you know, it, it, for me, it goes to a work shirt, and then it's, it's out, and then it's a rag, right? And then you got to get a new one again. So in other words, you know, that nothing's going to stop that. We've got to replenish, right? Because just things wear out. And, uh, but Jesus wants you to know that the Holy Spirit never wears out. The Holy Spirit always fits. 
The Holy Spirit is always what we need. And, and so he knows how to adjust, right, and, and get into all those places. So we have to know how to present our sacrifice at the temple and, um, and just know that this is a sacrifice. When you come to the house of God, it's a sacrifice of your time. And it's saying, I want to learn more about God, but you're replenishing. You're building up your inner man. You're making adjustments. You're saying, I am the Lord's, and I want to do God's will. And then we, you know, we, we get out of church, and then you know, there's a great adventure out there. But there's a lot of things, a lot of battles, but the battle belongs to the Lord. So Jesus was zealous for his house. And it says, let's go back to John chapter 2, verse, verse 16. No, it's, uh, let's see, it's, um, it's actually 17. It says, then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So there was a zeal. But see, if you look at the picture, remember that was a one-time thing. That, and he, he actually did it in the beginning of his ministry. And then Jesus had to come back again at the end of his ministry, his, his three-and-a-half-year ministry, and he cleansed the temple again because they didn't learn. And, and, they, and they judged him. You're coming to destroy our business. But the idea is, is Jesus is zealous that we would be in friendship with him. Jesus is zealous that we would depend upon him so he can show us great and mighty things. So he can use you to be that strong witness for your family and help deliver them because, you know, sometimes our loved ones get so entrenched in this world and it does get exhausting. I remember one time I, I was stuck in the mud. We were over in, in Menifee out there, and, and we were waiting for a church to open up, and I was staying in this, in this fifth wheel, and I was working as an assistant pastor, and we had a muddy driveway, okay? And that big rain came, and I could not get my car out of the mud. And I was going deeper and deeper in the mud. And we were pushing. I had, I had my wife out there. I had the kid out there and everything. And Lord, help us get out of the mud. And then the man with the four-wheel drive came, right? And a good winch. And he, he pulled me out of the mud, right? And, and the car needed to be cleaned up and everything. But sometimes we get, we get stuck in the mud and the zeal of the Lord is to get us out of the mud to get our family members out of being stuck but that's why we need that constant zeal if we keep our temple clean then we can keep our prayers going and just keep covering our loved ones and that hope is one day believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you'll be saved you and your household so just stay stay on task keep the the temple clean and then, this is so beautiful, that Jesus said in verse 19, he answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What Jesus is saying, if you destroy this temple, that in three days it will be raised up again. And then they came back and they said, well, this temple took 46 years to, to build. How can you say that it could be built again? See, it's just the pride of religion, the confusion of religion. How did they come up with the number of 46 years? Because the temple, is as humble as it was in the time of Ezra, was just a box, but they were discrediting the beginning of the temple. It goes back 546 years. See, they're not crediting all the little stuff and all the work that needed to take place in the generations that it took to get the temple built. But the only thing that they were seeing was the, really the, the exquisite work that King Herod did on covering things with gold and covering things with marble. They were saying, basically, they were saying that 46 years it took us to build. What? See, what they were only doing is they were only looking at themselves of the things that they like to do, the things that they like to see. They had forgotten about the history. 
They also forgot about the fact that who made the earth in six days? Who made the earth in six days? Right? God. Jehovah God. Elohim. He made the earth, right? Spoke it in six days. But see, they were so out of touch in religion. They were so in love with their temple. They were so in love with their comforts and their culture that they could not see. And see, and that's why we just need to be encouraged, you know, as we're concluding here that through the, through the Holy Spirit, we can see and we can appreciate. Yes, God made the earth in six days. And yes, in three days and three nights, right? He rose from the grave and he built the temple. All right, now what does it mean that in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed? What Jesus was saying is, is now the work is in you. The work is in the church. See, he changed the system from being the old Jewish temple that, you know, was hard to get to. And, you know, and if you lived in the close vicinity, it was okay. But what if you lived, you know, on the other side of the world? Of course, it was hard to get there. So the system had to be changed so that the church could be born and that God could live within the individual, within the individual through the power of the Holy Spirit. So it was a cleaning that had to take place with a purpose. And by the way, Hebrews 3, 5, and 6 says that the Son has authority to clean. The Son has authority to clean. And somebody says, well, he's not cleaning in my house. Well, guess what? He holds eternity, right? There's a heaven to gain. There's a hell to turn away from. But God's will, you know, he will, it will be done. So as we're in preparation and, and we're concluding now as far as let's ask the Lord and, and be really kind of historic and reflective and, and introspective that Pentecost is coming. Now let's make it special and let's really emphasize this week that we want to get close. This is what I want to do. I encourage you. Let's get closer to the Holy Spirit. Let's get closer to the Comforter. Let's, you know, Jesus, thank you. You're in my temple, right? Thank you that anything that he does, he leaves it better. He leaves it brand new, right? He takes it and he polishes it and he makes it usable. Amen. How many of you here want to be usable for the Lord? Amen. Well, let's all stand up together.